we're so used to gadgets as they're all around us 24 seven. We have only a basic understanding of how they work, but that's enough for us. Yet some devices, even when you see them for the first time, make you wonder, how, how does it work? Because the way such devices look raises more questions than answers. When in use, they can even make you doubt the inviability of the laws of physics. At least that's how it seems. And it's not just about the most advanced inventions. In the not so distant past, people sometimes came up with such whimsical gadgets that from a modern perspective seem like something another civilization might have created. And today we'll explore some of the most fascinating things. Will cars fly thanks to electrogravitation? How does an electricity-free fridge work? Can you watch a movie in 4K on a mechanical TV set? And what kind of wristwatch would an alien from the future wear? Gadgets that defy the laws of physics? Don't forget to hit the like button to support this channel. Your action helps YouTube understand that this is the content you want to see more of. What did our ancestors view as the laws of physics when physics itself didn't even exist as a science? They actually had a lot of laws and they certainly knew that one does not simply take off and fly. Yet eventually people did learn how to fly and even in several ways. Flying devices can be generally divided into a few groups. Lighter than air devices, balloons, airships, and any other devices that use Archimedes, buoyant force. Heavier than air devices that rely on the lifting force of wings and or blades, airplanes, helicopters, drones, and the like. Heavier than air devices that use vertical jet thrust, vertical takeoff aircraft, rockets, and any variations of such craft. One might think that it's impossible to come up with another method. And let's agree to keep some sci-fi technologies like anti-gravity out of the way. Not because they are impossible, but because we don't have such technology just yet. But then how can you explain this? If it's not anti-gravity, then what is it? Of course, if you're familiar with various technological tricks, you might not find it special at first. There are many videos online of metallic disks levitating over powerful electromagnets, often heating up in the process. However, a totally different principle applies to this, and it's astonishing once you understand how it works. Just take a look. This device is called an ion-propelled aircraft or lifter. It achieves lift using an ionic wind generated by the Biefeldt-Brown effect. Ionic wind. But we've agreed to keep science fiction out of this, you might say. In truth, it's not that complicated, but very intriguing and unexpected. Back in the 1920s, American scientists Thomas Brown and his assistant Paul Biefeld discovered an unusual effect. A certain force acted on a high voltage charged asymmetric capacitor that was so strong that it could lift the capacitor in the air. The scientist initially believed he had found a way to influence gravity with electricity. The newly discovered phenomenon was given a fitting name electrogravitation. If you look closely, you'll see a thin wire above the foil that plays a crucial role here. The voltage this wire gets is higher compared to the foil, tens of kilovolts to be precise. An intense electric field forms around the wires. There appears a coroner discharge that ionizes the air. Charged particles rush to the lower electrode and collide with air molecules, creating a significant flow known as the ionic wind. It's this wind that creates the force capable of lifting the structure into the air. Essentially, it's a form of jet thrust, but the way it arises is very unique. 
It looks impressive, but unfortunately the effect disappears in a vacuum as there's no air and nothing to ionize. It's a pity that the high voltage source is usually rather bulky. In many similar experiments, it's always positioned nearby and is connected to the lifter with wires. It's clear that the frame can only levitate within the tether's limits. However, there have been successful attempts to place everything on board and achieve an autonomous ion-propelled aircraft, which is quite impressive. This might seem like a new milestone in air travel, but of course, there are still many issues with this flight principle. Imagine what an iron craft designed to lift one person might look like. A gigantic fragile structure the size of a tennis court all under the voltage of tens of kilovolts. This doesn't seem like a good idea, plus it has very low efficiency. But just think back to the designs of the earliest airplanes and other flying devices and compare them to what they look like and how they operate now. Who can predict where innovation will take us and how such concepts will evolve in the next 50 years? Perhaps we'll finally get to see those silent flying cars from old sci-fi classics. Since the mass production of ion-propelled aircraft has still a long way to go, let's look at something more familiar. For instance, we're used to the back of the refrigerator getting warm. This is a normal side effect of the unit's operation, but how about the concept of a fridge that you literally have to heat up for it to cool things down? Sounds kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? Yet such technology exists. Refrigerators that use this principle are called absorption fridges. They can indeed operate without any electricity. At first glance, it might seem like they defy the law of physics, but let's see how it works. First, let's recall how a standard compression refrigerator works. Its operation principle is based on a mechanical compressor turning the gaseous refrigerant into a liquid that converts back into gas inside the evaporator and directs it to a large coil condenser at the back of the fridge where it's cooled by the surrounding air. The condenser and evaporator are separated by a valve that creates a pressure difference between them. In standard refrigerators, a capillary tube with a tiny cross-sectional area, for instance 0.2 millimeters, which is 0.008 inches, serves this purpose. The design ensures that only a very small amount of liquefied refrigerant can pass through it per unit of time. As a result, pressure increases in one part of the system and the refrigerant liquefies. In another part, the refrigerant boils and evaporates, taking away heat and lowering the temperature inside the fridge. As you can see in this picture, absorption refrigerators operate on a similar principle. Just like that, the refrigerator is cooled using a refrigerant boiling in the evaporator. And just like that, a condenser turns the refrigerant into a liquid form. However, that's where the similarities end, and instead of a regular compressor, a so-called thermal compressor is used, which combines an absorber and a generator. In the absorber, the refrigerant, often ammonia, is intensively absorbed by water. This process corresponds to the suction stroke of a standard refrigerator compressor. Ammonia is highly water absorbable. For example, at zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, one liter or 0.26 of a gallon of water can absorb over 1,000 liters, 264 gallons of ammonia. This water ammonia solution then goes to the generator where the solution is heated. Here, ammonia evaporates from the solution. This stage corresponds to the compression stroke in a conventional refrigerator. Although the absorption principle has been known for quite some time, using it to build a functional unit remained challenging for a long time due to some inherent contradictions. In the same gas circuit, the pressure had to be high in some sections and low in others. Moreover, a pumping mechanism had to be introduced. Although this seems relatively simple nowadays, engineers of that time couldn't achieve it. It wasn't until 1922 that Swedish inventors Platen and Munters managed to solve this issue. 
they took a very original and creative approach by introducing gaseous hydrogen into the system. This was the proverbial missing link that made such installations truly functional. Indeed, it's an elegant solution. The system contains no valves or compressors, operates quieter, and is much more durable compared to the standard compression refrigerators. This piqued industrialists' interest in such a device leading to the active production of such refrigerators from 1922 and onwards. What's more, this type of refrigerator without any major modifications is still successfully produced today. Now that we've established that one can make a mechanical refrigerator, perhaps it's time to switch other household appliances to something more unusual. Just for fun, how about a mechanical TV set for a change? No way, it's too out there, this can't be right. Many people would say, and they'd be wrong indeed. The very idea sounds far-fetched. Not only does it seem to violate the laws of physics, but also common sense, however, in reality, neither is violated. In fact, mechanical TV sets actually existed in the early 20th century. Just to be clear, some electricity would still be needed, but only for backlighting, not for image scanning. That would indeed be done mechanically. In modern LED TVs and plasma panels, scanning is done electronically and each pixel corresponds to a specific signal. Old bulky TVs with cathode ray tubes used an electron beam for scanning. Electromagnetics physically deflect it and it runs across the screen line by line. This happens very quickly and our eyes perceive this rapid movement of a single dot as an image. Turns out, there's also a mechanical way to scan a signal that uses the so-called Nipkauf disk. More than just a disk, it represents a foundational principle in early television technology. It is essentially the first mechanical image scanning device. It was invented by the German technician Paul Nipkauf in 1884. Here's how it works. The disc has holes at varying distances from the center. When spun rapidly, the holes pass by a light bulb and this is perceived by the human eye as glowing arcs and stripes merging into a small glowing area. Now, if you modulate the brightness of the light bulb with a signal, you'll get an image. This brings to mind a fun gadget that produces an impressive illusion of hovering, glowing numbers and inscriptions using a fan and LED strip. Only here the light source is stationary and everything relies on rotating holes synchronized with the designated flicker of the bulb. Such mechanical televisions were quite popular up until the 1930s. However, they had many limitations. The most significant and overwhelming was the resolution. For obvious reasons, such devices could display a maximum of 80 lines and on average only 30. Of course, no one was thinking about 4K 100 years ago, but still 30 lines seems pretty depressing. What prevented increasing the resolution? Not physics, but common sense. To scale such a gadget's resolution to as little as 480 lines, one would need a disc that was 30 meters, 98 feet wide. This is hardly feasible unless you want to feature it in a myth-busting show. Since we're on the subject, let's have some fun and speculate on the size of the disc needed for a 4K resolution. Some enthusiasts have already done the calculations. 620 meters, that's 20,034 feet. That's two Eiffel Towers stacked up on top of each other. Indeed, this is where beloved steampunk would clearly hit its technological limitations. All right, if a mechanical television is a thing, what other strange and unusual stuff has humanity come up with that might just challenge our understanding of the laws of physics? To answer this, we can't help but turn to the legacy of a legendary man who epitomizes the triumph of human genius over the forces of nature. Of course, we're talking about Nikola Tesla. Surprisingly, we won't be discussing electricity, but rather water. Please don't be surprised. Tesla's genius went far beyond electric current. He dabbled in many other things. For instance, he came up 
and patented numerous inventions of varying utility. One of them is a remarkable example of an idea that's brilliant in its simplicity. First, let's make some things clear. What is a valve? It is a device that allows fluid or gas to flow in one direction and blocks it in another. Clearly, no pump, even the most natural one, like our heart, can function without a valve. Every valve should contain a movable element that rotates or shifts under the influence of flow, either opening or closing a passage. The shapes and designs can vary, but the principle is always the same. However, with Nikola Tesla, some things never work the way they usually do. He devised a mechanism with no moving parts that allows fluid to flow freely in one direction and blocks it in another. The trick is that the blocking force preventing the fluid from flowing is the fluid itself. The magic lies in the design of the device, the shape and the direction of the channels. When fluid flows in one direction, it remains undivided and laminar. In the reverse direction, it splits into multiple streams that counteract each other. The flow becomes turbulent, losing much of the fluid's kinetic energy, significantly decreasing the flow rate and creating a high resistance to the oncoming flow. The solution is quite elegant. The water blocks itself. However, in practice, it doesn't work as one might imagine at first. Many enthusiasts have personally tried to replicate Tesla's valve, recording their results on video. So what do we see? Could it be non-functional? Is Tesla called a great illusion master for a reason? On the contrary, it works, but not in the way you would expect. Indeed, we see that the valve stops the water only briefly before it eventually finds a way out. But that's how this valve is supposed to work. It's actually designed for short-term flow blockage. So what's its practical application? Who could possibly need this? Many people could. This invention is genuinely effective in systems where the flow direction changes rapidly in a pulse mode. That is, the application of Tesla's valve is very specific. It can be used in micro pumps or conversely in something more impressive like pulsating rocket engines. We've already seen quirky devices that can astonish you with how they work and what they can produce. Often you don't need complicated mechanics to achieve this. However, the most magical things that revolutionize our world happen in the field of microelectronics. We can't see these wonders with the naked eye because they are incredibly small, but we can describe them by interpreting complex formulas and calculations. Occasionally, the things you see in microelectronics are so unexpected that you can't help but stay in awe. For instance, when talking about gadget memory, most people would imagine this. IT specialists would probably see something like this. But hardly anyone would even remotely think of something like this. And yet this too is memory, but how? Why does it look like this? How does it function? Does it really work? You're about to find out. This is the so-called ferrite core memory. While it may seem like an exotic relic now, there was a time when such memory was the pinnacle of progress. So what is it? It's precisely what you see, an array of metallic rings with wires threaded through them. The passing current magnetizes the rings in one direction or another. And that's it, you have zeros and ones, the binary numbering system. Moreover, just like in modern gadgets and computers, there are both rewritable and read-only memories. In the former, the rings magnetize when the current flows through the wires. In the latter, the rings are pre-magnetized, allowing the current to read but not re-magnetize them. Magnetic ferrite core memory devices consisted of units, comprised units with numerous ring magnets arranged in orderly rows in the form of a flat or spatial grid. In a full memory block, there could be up to hundreds of thousands of them. The cores were mostly one to five millimeters, 0.008, to 0.2 inches in diameter, and in the most advanced machines, the minimum diameter reached 0.25 to 0.30 millimeters, 0.1 to 0.012 inches. You see, 
There was a race back then, just as there is now. The only difference is that now it concerns extra nanometers in microchips. Naturally, we see it today as an incredibly bulky, inefficient, and potentially glitchy structure. It even looks like something out of Leonardo da Vinci's workshop. However, this technology was actually used on the Apollo spacecraft as part of the lunar program. And what's more, American shuttles employed such, well, electronics up until 1991. Let's shift our focus from exotics and explore another memory type that surprises us with the sheer fact that someone ever thought of such an idea. This is memory based on an electron beam tube. This is another quite old gadget which is called the Williams tube. Its operation principle is very similar to that of bulky TV sets. An electromagnetic beam hits a phosphor, knocking an electron out of a cell. Only in this case, it's not done to show us the evening news, but to create a matrix of positively charged cells on the surface. This matrix will encode the required information in binary form. As one would expect, there are no fewer problems here than in the previously mentioned chain mail. At least, the very least, such memory had to be frequently refreshed due to rapid charge dissipation. Nonetheless, Williams tubes were widely used in the 40s to the 1950s, and there wasn't much of an alternative back then. By the way, you can really trace a whole technological evolution here. The first tube had a capacity of, wait for it, one bit. As the technology improved, the capacity increased to thousands of times that. If the Williams tube has failed to impress you, we have something special just for you. This is memory based on mercury delay lines. Just think about it. Mercury delay lines. The very phrase sounds ominous. So what exactly is this memory about? The functional part consists of a long tube filled with mercury and piezoelectric elements installed at both ends. One acts as a speaker, the other as a microphone. Hold on, what? What speaker and microphone are we talking about? We're discussing memory, right? Indeed we are. Keep watching and you'll be surprised more than once. The first piezoelectric element creates a sound wave in the memory. As this wave moves through the mercury, it retains memory. Yes, you've heard that right. As long as it moves, it retains memory. But what happens next? Then the second piezoelectric element reads it. If the information should be stored, it's relayed back to the first element, sending the wave on another round and creating a loop. Although it sounds simple, the implementation of the idea is still mind-blowing. Mercury, sound waves, and here's what it looks like. The entire setup might seem like a relic from a museum of useless inventions or like something an eccentric engineer would come up with to prove some point. One can't help but wonder, why is it so complicated? Well. Just because, why not? Technological progress occasionally takes some whimsical paths. This memory based on mercury delay lines only proves this point. However, it's riddled with challenges. The memory is not durable and needs to be constantly refreshed. There's no random access, only sequential. So high efficiency is something you can't even fathom. Mercury's temperature had to be constantly maintained at precisely 40 degrees Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Any deviation would alter the speed of sound, throwing off all configurations. The memory needs very precise synchronization, and all of this consumes a monstrous amount of energy. Again, why would anyone need this? Surprisingly, despite its wildly intricate structure where literally everything seems excessive, it turned out to be more advantageous than the alternatives cheaper and more reliable than vacuum tubes, faster than relays, more durable than Williams tubes. As preposterous as it sounds, these devices were used up until the 1960s, right up to the dawn of the space age. All right, we've seen some dinosaurs from the world of prehistoric electronics, and while they certainly didn't violate any laws of physics, they certainly show a rather peculiar application of these laws. But are we yet to see the most outstanding type of memory in the future? Absolutely, and we could take a sneak peek into this future. In fact, some of these ultra-modern devices seem to leap straight from the pages of sci-fi. 
quantum memory immediately comes to mind. An invention that doesn't break the laws of physics, but rather bends them to their extremes. You'll hear more about that in a minute. As for promising memory types, there have been ongoing developments in the field. For instance, there's a holographic optical memory. Unlike traditional storage that uses a single layer of bits on a medium surface, this method stores data volumetrically. Does this ring a bell? In science fiction, mysterious crystals often appear as data storage devices. Who knows, maybe the future flash drives will look just like that. By the way, it seems perfect even in terms of bandwidth. Transferring data to such holographic media will be much faster than our traditional memory. This is because a laser can send modulated signals, not sequentially one bit at a time, but in a whole beam, and more importantly, a very large beam. This could potentially be a million times faster than today's standards. There's also the so-called 5D memory, and no, it doesn't involve additional dimensions. Instead, this memory uses a medium with the tiniest elements that have five adjustable characteristics, namely three spatial coordinates, polarization, and transparency levels. This is what allows us to vastly scale up such memory. There are many more memory options, some quite unexpected. Quantum memory particularly stands out among these innovative storage methods, seemingly challenging both physics and logic. Let's go back to it. Quantum computers. You've likely heard of them countless times, and many of you even have a working knowledge of how they operate. So let's dive right into it. Given that we have quantum computers, it stands to reason that there should be quantum memory, right? It would only make sense if there was one. Even though quantum computers differ drastically from our traditional ones, the general idea is still the same. A quick reminder for those who need it, the magic of quantum computers begins with the fundamental principles of their operation. Traditional memory has cells, each encoding either a zero or a one. However, in quantum memory, each cell encodes both states simultaneously, both zero and one. This isn't merely a metaphor, but a direct result of quantum mechanics. This phenomenon is known as superposition. Think of Schrodinger's cat, which is simultaneously dead and alive. That's the concept at play here. Such cells are called qubits or quantum bits. Physically, these could be superconducting loops with a current circulating in both directions at once. Or they could be ion traps, where a particle exists in two places simultaneously. The main thing is that you can encode a combination of four states with two qubits, eight states with three qubits, and so on, exponentially. Over a quadrillion states can be stored in just 50 qubits. Essentially, that's over a thousand terabytes in just 50 cells. This definitely seems to challenge not just the laws of physics, but also mathematics. How does all of this work? Well, that's a topic for another day. Quantum computers are at the forefront of science, where humanity closely interacts with the fundamental laws of the universe itself, the very fabric of what is all around us. Since we are on the subject of gadgets, let's consider something that we most closely associate with this word. After all, it's only natural to think about a gadget as something compact we carry with us. Let's imagine our descendant from the distant future visiting us today. What would he wear on his wrist? What could the wrist gadget of a future traveler look like? Setting aside fantastical ideas like handheld teleporters, an atomic wristwatch seems quite plausible. This may come as a surprise, but something similar already exists. At least, we're not that far from such technology. Of course, we're not talking about watches with a miniature atomic reactor. That would be too out there, even for the science fiction. This is not about radiation at all. There's none, because these devices would operate based not on nuclear decay, but on processes involving electrons in atomic orbitals. This doesn't result in any dangerous radiation. Here's how atomic clocks function. We take a suitable substance, usually rubidium or cesium. Then we evaporate it and pass microwave radiation of a specific frequency through the resulting gas. Electrons absorb this radiation and move to a higher energy level. These levels are selected 
so that absorption occurs when the frequency precisely matches the pre-calculated value. The slightest deviation in either direction nullifies the effect. Sensitive sensors monitor the absorption of microwaves and a feedback system adjusts the radiation frequency so that it always matches the set one. This standard is then used to count seconds, minutes and so forth with great precision. One of the main advantages of such devices is that they can be compact. Even the most basic models can be placed in a small case which would easily fit on an extremely precise navigation satellite. And if a visitor from the past needed such precision, we would have some good news for them. Even now, we have super compact atomic clock models smaller than a matchbox. They contain a capsule with the working substance just a few millimeters in diameter. Instead of microwaves, we use an infrared laser modulated by microwaves. To measure absorption, these devices simply look at the transparency instead of separating excited atoms with a magnetic field forming a beam and so on. As a result, while the accuracy of these miniature atomic clocks is slightly less than their larger counterparts, they remain impressive. While the most accurate quartz watches deviate by one second in two to three months, miniature atomic ones would only err by a second every 600 years, spanning multiple generations. As you can see, even in the past, humanity managed to create devices that looked quite odd and had no less peculiar behavior. We are now on the verge of new discoveries that may not only challenge the laws of physics, but also uncover some new ones.